Well, they closed the doors and everybody got quiet. Dallas is sitting up here and the clock's still ticking back there. So if somebody comes in a little bit after we make these announcements, maybe we can fill them in. But it is about time to begin our worship service this morning. We also want to welcome the visitors that are with us this morning. We see a few that are uh, visiting with us that we just count as family. Glad that they're here and uh, good, good to see you. Wish everybody safety as they travel home. We're thankful for our visitors and we invite you to be back with us at every opportunity. We'll meet again tonight at six and then we meet at seven o'clock on Wednesday night. As we begin worship this morning, let's bow together. Our Holy Father, we're so thankful for all your blessings. Father, help us to understand how truly blessed that we are. We're thankful to meet in this comfortable building to worship you and to praise your name. And Father, we ask that as we worship this morning, it be done in spirit and in truth and in a way that's well-pleasing unto you. Father, we're mindful of all those in our congregation who are hurting, either physically or through bereavement. Father, we ask your blessing on them and touch them and relieve them as only you can. Father, we ask for safety throughout this holiday season. And Father, we ask that you bless our country and help us to return to being a nation under God. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first song this morning will be number 238, number 238. And then after the song, we'll be led in prayer. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today mindful of all the blessings that you give us that we have the health and the strength that allows us to get up and come out and worship you. And we pray that you will forgive us of our sins. And we know the promise has been made that if we will go, we can have our sins forgiven and we will just repent. And we pray for strength that we might stay committed to resolve and in our hearts and follow through and not commit the sins that we know are sins. And we pray, dear God, that you'll be with our congregation. Help us this morning as we worship you that we might remove from our hearts, our minds, those things that would distract us, that we might pay close attention to the lesson that Brother Mitchell has prepared, that we might gain something from the worship service that that's our purpose of being here is to worship you and we pray that everything that we do and say will be pleasing in your sight. We pray that your will will be done always and help us to read the scriptures that the Holy Spirit has inspired those men in the past to write for us that we might know what your will is for our life. And if we don't study, then we have no knowledge of what we should be doing. And so I just pray that we will always be willing to look diligently at your word, that we might find lessons that apply to us that will help us to be a better and stronger servant for you. We pray for those that are sick, that aren't able to be with us. We're mindful of Sister Mares that she's suffering and we pray, dear God, that you will be with the family and help them that uh, they might comfort her. And we pray that you will also. We pray for Brother Lester, as Oliver, as he's going to see the doctors about his risk. And we pray that they can do the surgery to eliminate this pain for him. We pray for Sister Bona Sheet's father that the treatments that he's going to receive in the home that he's going to will help him to have a better life. And we realize, dear God, there's a time for all of us that we have to pass from this life. And we pray that you'll help each and every one of us that we can live our life in such a way when that time comes that you'll be able to receive us into the home that's been prepared for those that are faithful. We're mindful of the men and women that are in uniforms that serving our country. We pray that you will be with them and, and help them to be safe. We pray, dear God, that you will be with <clears throat> the elders of this congregation, that you will help them and guide them and give them the strength to always look to you for guidance. And we're so thankful for their ability and their knowledge that they are willing to serve you and give their time and dedicate their service and their life. And we're thankful that your wives support them in this effort. And we're so grateful, dear God, that we have men that can lead us in singing. And we have those that are willing to teach the various Bible classes. And we pray that you will be with each and every one of them and with every person that's serving in this congregation. So many women that do wonderful works that we're not even aware of. And we're thankful for them. And we pray that you will continue to give them the strength and they can continue that work. We're thankful for Brother Lyndall Mitchell and his ability and for his dedication, for his study that he prepares lessons that we know that we can tell by the way he presents them that he's well prepared and always has been. We pray that you will be with the deacons that serve with our elders, those people that take care of the grounds and all works that's being done here that sometimes we just overlook and take for granted. We pray that you will be with each of us that we might look to our lives and see if we can't find something that we can do to serve you in a better way. I'm just so thankful, dear God, for our families and for our children and our grandchildren. I pray that you'll help us to be good examples for them. We pray that you'll be with us throughout our walks of life, wherever it may take us. Help us to always be mindful of our obligations, not only to serve you ourselves but try to help others 
and find those people that we can lead to Christ before it's too late for them. We ask all these things in your Son and our Savior's name. Amen. Number 274. Number 274. I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valleys, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. If you would like to mark our song of encouragement, it'll be number 389, number 389. And before Brother Mitchell comes and preaches to us from God's word, we'll sing number 367, number 367.
good to see each of you gathered here this morning, and I hope that what we do together today is going to be of great meaning to you and then be acceptable to our Lord uh, more than anything. We're going to talk today about a subject that the whole world is thinking about that has any affiliation or affinity for things spiritual uh, in a Christian standpoint, or from a Christian standpoint. Genesis 3 and verse 15, this uh, was said long, long ago, God speaking to the adversary who'd led mankind into sin. He said, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. Enmity means hostility. And between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. And then Galatians 4 and verse 4, that was a prophecy in Genesis 3 and 15. Galatians 4 and verse 4, Paul writes, But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son born of a woman, born under the law. Since it is the season when the Christian world, using that in the broadest sense, thinks about the arrival of Jesus, that's what we're going to do too. Talk about the time when he came. Uh, I think it not something that we shouldn't do. Uh, we used to feel kind of compelled, I think, to preach it in reverse and talk about all the reasons we should not keep and are not authorized to keep a, a religious festival full of uh, a lot of ritual and what have you that Jesus never authorized. And we shouldn't do that. And we've never done that. But there's a great difference between that kind of thing and studying what the Bible says about the arrival of the Savior. And it was not like that was done uh, in a corner somewhere. Or it, was, it was something uh, hidden because it is the subject, as we shall see, of many prophecies. There have been great days in God's creation, many great days, in the interaction that God has with humanity. And the day of the Lord's birth, whatever season it was, we don't know if it was December the 25th or if it was any other day, but we ought to think about the Lord, it seems to me, every day. That should occupy a great deal of, of what our mind is dwelling on and where we are in our heart of hearts. As we approach the subject today, I want us to think about the background and consider why he came, what made it necessary for him to come down to this low land of sin. It's not the kind of place that you would expect to find someone like him. Sin came with the fall. The fall marks the time when sin arrived in the world. Prior to that, man and, and the woman lived in the Garden of Eden, as you know, in a pristine and ideal environment. And all that he had to do, all that man had to do was dress and keep the garden. And he had access to even the tree of life. And God gave Adam and Eve clear instructions about what they were to do and what they weren't to do. And there was, it's just really simple. You can eat of any of the trees in the garden except that one. That is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in the day that you, the King James says, thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And so they knew that. And made clear to them, Genesis chapter 2, Eve understood. And I say she understood because she was capable of explaining to the serpent what the, the rules that the Lord had laid down were. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, it says, For uh, from the fruit of the trees of the garden you may eat. She's telling the serpent, that's what God said, but from the tree of which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. And Satan, of course, tempted her, as you know, twisting the words of the Lord, like he does. He is a liar, and he is the father of all lies. And here we see him at the very beginning of creation, doing what he does so, I won't say well, what he does so wickedly, and that's lie. Verses 4 through 7 of Genesis 3, the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows in the day that you eat it uh, from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and gave also to her husband with her. And he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. The result of the fall was the, the perfect world that God had made has become marred by sin. It's broken. And it's not only the spiritual world, but it also broke the physical world. And a lot of negative things began to impact us and still impact us as a result of that decision. Immediately following the completion of the sixth day of creation, God had previously declared all that he had made was very good. Genesis 1.31. Couldn't have had a better environment than what he provided. But after sin came into the world, the very ground was cursed. Genesis 3 and 17. Prior to the fall, uh, Adam and Eve enjoyed direct fellowship with God, their creator, because they were pure. There was no sin in them, no guile in them. And there were times when the Lord came to the garden uh, to be with the man and the woman. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8 says the Lord was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And that would have been a welcome visit for Adam and for Eve to have the Lord come. After the fall, they were separated from his majesty. Because sin cannot be in the presence of God. And it consequently drove them out of the garden and prevented them from entering it again. Genesis 3 and 24 tells us. And before their sin, Adam and Eve had open access to the tree of life. And they could uh, approach it. They could take the fruit. They could live forever if they wanted to. And they were able to stretch out their hand, it says, from, and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever, Genesis 3.22 tells us. God uh, had previously warned Adam what will result from defiance, and we've said that already. Uh, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. What's this got to do with when Jesus came? It's got to do with the reason why he came. And after man sinned, God reminded Adam that the fate that was to be imposed was exactly what he'd promised. And so in Genesis 3 and 19, he says, By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now in response to the changes coming because of sin, God prophesied the coming of the Christ. Before the world ever was, God had a plan. In Genesis 3 and 15, it was read in your hearing just a moment ago. God says to the serpent, and I will put enmity between your seed and the woman. And he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. And from the very beginning, the day of Jesus' birth was a part of God's plan. That was made necessary because man had created a dilemma for himself that he couldn't mitigate. He couldn't fix. He was in deep, deep trouble and, and grave, imminent danger of eternal destruction because of what he chose to do. And nobody could help him save one. And there was a promise given to Abraham, the father of the faithful, about the coming one. And the fulfillment of that prophecy regarding the seed of woman was given as a promise to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18, he says, In your seed, speaking to Abraham, in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. All nations being blessed through his seed is looking forward to the time that Jesus of Nazareth is going to be born in a small little hamlet in Palestine. And this point is made by both Peter and Paul in Acts chapter 3, verse 24. You begin there. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announce these days. 
and it is you who are the ones of the pro or sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. For you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. Galatians 3, verse 16, Paul writes, Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather as to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. There was one coming, and only one coming, because only one could deal with the sin problem. There was no other. Moses presented the law to the people as a teacher to bring them to this coming one. Galatians Chapter 3 and verse 24 says, Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. And so all of that from the garden on, from the time that he spoke to Moses in the mountain, he's progressing down the corridor of time, coming to this event that takes place in Bethlehem. David received a promise. Well, before that, Abraham was told that more than all the nations being blessed by his seed, he was, he was also made another promise in Jeff, uh, Genesis 17 and verse 6 where he said, kings will come forth from you. And we find one of those kings in the person of David and a promise re being recorded that his descendants uh, will are from within his descendants, will come one to reign the Christ. Second Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13 says, When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. No end. This is why many uh, Old Testament prophecies, some in this very lesson, describes the Messiah as a king because he is a king. He's the son of a king. And he is, that's on his human side. And in his divinity, he's been crowned king of kings and lord of lords. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that he, they might receive the adoption as sons. Jesus would be born into the world to fulfill the prophecy that was made way back in the garden. In the very early, early times, and Genesis twenty two eighteen said, uh, in this seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And so when he came, we see that all the way through. There's one coming. There's one coming. There's one coming. And the fact that sin came into the world and uh, that one was coming, everything had to, had to fall into place. There had to be a preservation process to preserve a remnant through whom he could come. And we don't know really all that God has done in order to make that a reality. But notice the prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 22, verses 3 through 6. The people of, of Israel were often punished because of their brazen rebellion and their resistance to the will of God but yet they're never destroyed. And so you have this prophecy given by Jeremiah, and he says, Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries to which I have driven them and bring them back to their pasture, and they will be fruitful and multiply. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, that I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. 
So while there are many, many noteworthy events recorded in the Old Testament that provide valuable lessons, the point that we emphasize just now is this. As all the events were unfolding among the Jewish people, despite their rebelliousness, a remnant was preserved so that the promise to send the Christ could be fulfilled. We see God acting in time and space. And this would make salvation from sin available to the people of Judah and Israel, as well as to all the nations of the earth, as Isaiah spoke in Isaiah 2, 2 and 3. And so there we are. That's the background. Man has polluted himself and polluted God's world. And he has no claim. And he cannot do anything to rectify his own problem. And yet, for some unfathomable reason, God loves man. And he loves man to a degree that is, that is just impossible to be able to explain. And then he sends his son. We see the day's events begin to unfold. Jesus, king of kings, is born in humble circumstances. He could have come, had he chosen to, with a retinue of angelic warriors. He could have come in opulence and wealth and could have constructed a palace like nothing that anyone had ever seen before or would ever see again. He could have done all those things. But he was born in humble circumstances. Born wrapped, the King James Bible says, in swaddling clothes. They're just cloths. And he's laid in a manger. We call it a feed trough where I'm from because there wasn't any room for them in the inn. And so that's where they had to go just to get in out of the weather. And we know that his family, his earthly family, was poor because of the, the offerings that they made. They made a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of dirt, turtle doves and two young pigeons. That's from the law, uh, Leviticus chapter 12 and verse 8. Because not everybody could afford to offer up a lamb. And so the provision made, and that's what Joseph and Mary did. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Not Jerusalem. Not one of the great cities. He was born in Bethlehem. Too little to be considered significant, Micah said in Micah 5 and verse 2. He wasn't coming with the trappings of wealth. He wasn't coming with the... Uh, the backing of obvious military power and force. Born in a little place, Bethlehem. And he was raised up in Nazareth in Galilee. Uh, not considered to be a very auspic auspicious place. Uh, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 8 and, and verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. Anybody could access him. Anybody could approach him. There was no reason. There was no impediment. You know, had he come with all the regalia of royalty and uh, come manifesting the power at his disposal, people couldn't even have survived in his presence, much less dared to approach him. But anybody could approach that little baby laying in a manger in a feed trough. Anybody. And before we even consider his crucifixion, we see that the Lord is willing to sacrifice for us in being born in such humble circumstances and in his agreement to come down to this low land of sin. Because you remember, he said, nobody takes my life from me. I'll lay it down. And he laid it down in such a remarkable way. There are many prophecies concerning the coming of Christ, the kind of life that he would live, the kind of ministry that he would conduct. There's prophecies made to his family. Mary was astounded at what an angel came and told her in Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 30. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. 
into his kingdom will have no end. Can you imagine a young maiden in Israel, a pure virgin, receiving news that she would bear the son of the very God come in the flesh. And her fiancé, as we would call it, Joseph, is confused. He doesn't know what to make of the news that his betrothed is expecting a child. And he thinks what anybody would think. Some malfeasance has taken place. So Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 23, he receives assurance from an angel in a vision. But he said, when he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, a, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. That prophet, of course, was Isaiah, and he was speaking in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. He's also in chapter 9. He speaks about it. We'll come to that. Joseph and Mary's mind's been put at ease. And then for whatever reason, the sovereign God announced the birth of his son to a group of shepherds of all people. Guys that had to get their hands dirty. I wonder who those shepherds were, and I hope to meet them someday. Because they were not, by the world's standards, men of power and influence. But they stood in pretty good with the Lord. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 12. Let me go over there. I want to read that. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you, and you will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. And then that announcement was heralded by an angelic chorus. And the day is coming, and the promises are being fulfilled. They justifiably were terrified. Can you imagine? Someone like Michael or Gabriel, only two named angels, there's multitudes. One of those mighty creatures appearing in your presence, the glory of the Lord shining all around. Word also came to God's faithful servants in the temple. There was Luke chapter 2, verse 25 beginning, and there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he'd seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry for, out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and he blessed God. And he said, now, Lord, you're releasing your bondservant to depart in peace. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to be to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. Another servant that was in the temple, Luke 2, 36 through 38, and there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, she was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then as a widow had to the age of 84. She never left the temple serving night and day with fastings and prayers. And at the very moment she came up and began giving thanks to God and continuing to speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. You know, in 
human terms, you'd have thought maybe they'd had a big parade and had lots of dignitaries there, all dressed up in their various kinds of regalia, indicating their high office credentials and all. But these were people that probably a lot of the folks in the world didn't take too much notice of. But again, the Lord did. And we see him fulfilling his promises. The prophecies show Jesus was the fulfillment of what God had forecast. He was the realization of the promise made to Abraham, the father of all faithful. Christ was the reason that the nation of Israel had been preserved to that very hour and for no other reason. And honor was given to the Christ as he makes his arrival. And wise men from the east, I wish I knew a lot more about that. You can ask, but I can't answer you. I'll tell you that up front. I wish I knew a lot more about that. But there were wise men from the east that arrived, Matthew 2, 1 and 2, and they came to worship Jesus who was born king. And after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. So that story's been lost to us except here. We don't, there's just so much. But men of significance, wise men, came to pay the homage to the Christ. And when they saw him, Matthew 2, verse 11, they fell down to the ground and they worshiped him and they presented him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now, what lessons are to be gained from this? There are many more than, than we'll cite, but there are a few. God's promises are sure and steadfast. What God promises you is reliable. And as my daddy used to say, you can put your weight down on it. And it'll support you. The plan to send Jesus to save humanity predated creation itself. Revelation 13 and verse 8 says, And all who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone who, whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life, the Lamb who was been slain. The promises were initially given in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3 and verse 15 in the very beginning. And the promise was also given to Abraham centuries before the birth of Jesus. And there were numerous other prophecies that related to him. Some scholars count as many as 300. I wouldn't venture the, uh, to settle on a fixed number, but there are many, many prophecies, unquestionably, about this Jesus, about his birth. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Isaiah had said, Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Peter, uh, Matthew picks that up and says, This is what Isaiah was talking about. In Isaiah 9 verses 6 and 7, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. No one name can contain him or describe him. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. In Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, But as for you, Bethlehem, Erephthah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago from the days of eternity. These passages show not only Jesus would be born, but that he would be unique. Never been one like him. Not one like him now. Never been a one like him. He is unique. His arrival was attended by miraculous acts. He would be different from everyone else that had ever been. 
or that would ever be born as we've stated and his life's work would not be limited or stopped by his physical death. There's over a billion people in this world as corrupt as this, over a billion people that claim allegiance to Christ Jesus. His work has not been upended and he's not scared and he's not worried and nor should we be. God keeps his promises. He keeps his word. Sure and steadfast. Paul told the Romans, Romans 15 and verse 4, for whatever was written in the earlier times was written for our instructions. So through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. In a study of the Old Testament, it is encouraging uh, as it stresses that God will always do what he says. The writer uh, to the Hebrews cited the Lord's promise and oath to Abraham in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. Two unchangeable things guarantee the promise, providing strong encouragement to take hold of the hope that's set before us, he said. God cannot lie. And they're still holding on to that hope. And so should we. When we contemplate Jesus' birth and examine all the ancient prophecies fulfilled in that birth, we see that God keeps his word, giving us sufficient reason to trust him. We have reasons to trust him. God's love is seen to have motivated him. Why would he put that on his son and ask his son to come down here and give himself. I love God's people, but I would not sacrifice that young man for them. I don't have that, but God did. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Sin ruined man's relationship with God. And sadly, man continues to sin. Paul said in Romans 3 and 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Adam introduced it into the world by violating the law of God in the garden and then all sinned by following Adam's example. Romans 5 and verse 12, therefore just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. Rather than causing, uh, casting us aside forever, God chose to save us. Peter declared, God is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. Forgiveness is available through the blood of Christ shed on the cross. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. That's what God did. That's how much he cares. Sending Jesus to die for us demonstrates this inexplicable, unfathomable love that God has. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 and verse 8, Jesus, humanity is seen here. When the Lord came to the earth, he partook of flesh. He became one of us. God in flesh. That's what Emmanuel means. God with us. That's what he told the disciples when they said, well, just show us the Father. And he said, don't you understand that when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. You see standing before you the manifestation of God in flesh. Hebrews 2 and verse 12 says, therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. And through death, he might render powerless him who has the power of death, that is the devil. And when he came, he not only took up flesh, he took up the position of a bond servant, not an exalted position, not a high position. In Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8, now, while on earth, he was still God in flesh. Paul explained in Colossians 2 and verse 9, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells bodily. When Jesus walked in flesh among men, he provided a perfect example for us, leaving all of us without any excuse. In 1 Peter 1, 21 and 22, he says, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example 
for you to follow in his steps who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. As creator, Jesus didn't come to the earth in ignorance. He didn't come trying to discover what it's like for man to experience this low life of sin. He knew what it was like, and he knew what was going to happen. As the omniscient creator, he already knew what he would have to endure and how our minds respond to trials and temptations. He knew all that. And Jesus came to show us his understanding of all of this and to prove that he can sympathize with us and show us it is worth every effort to defeat sin and please God. That's why he came. And his flawless example ought to move us to follow him and to accept his invitation. God's plan from before the creation of the world was to send Jesus. In Ephesians 1 and 4, the text says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. God loved us and sought to save us despite our sin. To do this required that the son of the very God die on a cross at the hands of his adversaries. And Jesus arrived, and his arrival is the proof of the, the proof that God cares so deeply for us and is willing to do whatever it takes in order to redeem us. And so the question is, are you willing to submit to his will and to act in obedience to those things that he requires of those that would be named among his children? If you're here today and you're not a New Testament Christian, if you're not in covenant with Jesus, who is the Christ, I would urge you not to leave here in that state because there's still it still is the case that there is salvation in no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. We must be in Christ. If you are not, you can be. If you believe Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God, repent and turn away from sin. Confess your faith. Consent to be baptized for the remission of sins. Rise up to walk in the new life. Luxuriating in the love of the very God. If we can help you, why don't you come now as together we stand and sing.
Be seated, please. To help to prepare our minds for the partaking of the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 645, number 645.
Part of our worship service, we gather here this morning around this table to remember that Jesus did come to this earth, that he was born as was prophesied, that he lived a perfect life, and that he died for our sins and, and was risen on the third day. Because of the church that he established with his death, we have the opportunity to spend eternity in heaven if we obey him. As Brother Lindell said in his sermon, we're, we're not commanded to remember the Lord's birth, also, although we're thankful for it every hour of every day that he did come to this earth, but we are told to remember his death upon the cross. Jesus himself instituted this memorial and said, do this in remembrance of me. He told us to partake in a worthy manner that we would proclaim his death till he came by doing this. And so at this time, that's what we want to do. We want to focus our minds on him, the great promises, and the wonderful sacrifice and the wonderful love that he showed for us. Would you pray with me for the bread, please? Father, we thank you so much for your love for us as you showed by allowing your son to die on the cross for our sins. Father, as we gather here this morning, we pray that you will be with us as we partake of this bread which represents his body that hung on that cross for our sins. Father, may we partake in a manner pleasing in your sight. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us pray for the cup. Father, again, we thank you for everything that you do for us, and particularly, Father, for this fruit of the vine rep that represents, Father, the, the blood that our Savior shed for us, that pure blood that cleanses us from all sins, Father, when we are obedient to you. Father, we pray that as we partake of this fruit of the vine, that it will be in a manner pleasing in your sight. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. Because this is a convenient time, another obligation we have as Christians is to give of our means. We are not passing the trays, as you know, but there is a box in the foyer as you leave that where you can place your contribution. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we're so thankful to you for your son. Father, we're thankful for the church. We're thankful for the church here at this place and everyone who's a part of it. Father, we thank you so much for all the blessings that you bless us with. We know that everything good comes from you, Father. Father, help us at this time to give cheerfully. 
Help us to give as we've been prospered, Father. We ask you to bless these funds, Father, that they may be used to build up your cause here and elsewhere. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I hope that you will travel safely for those of you that are traveling. I hope you've been blessed by your presence here this morning. And I implore you, if you're in the community, to make time to come back and be with us tonight. We'll worship our Lord and Savior again. But just now, let's be standing as we're dismissed with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for that day. And uh, bless all the sick, Edwin Kirk, Africa, and my and help all the ones traveling back home from where they came and take care of them. Let us be back in that point. And, 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 and,